kingdom of Christ for a thousand years. I always want to remind you that chapter 20 covers a thousand years of future human history. So that's why uh, uh, God has a lot to say in those things, but chapter 20 covers that thousand years, but you can find more detail about it throughout different portions of the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. And so we've kind of walked through the Bible in order to kind of get a good picture of this. We've already talked about the first three components of the age of the millennium. Remember I told you that they're like, uh, I think I told you there were six components that make up the age of the kingdom, the millennial kingdom that is coming. And so we've already talked about three of them. What was the first one? It was the arrival of the sun. And remember, always remember that the, king, the kingdom cannot begin until the king arrives. And so we talked about the arrival of the sun. That was in Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 21. And what that does is it reveals to us the glorious arrival of the Lord Jesus Christ, who returns in great power and glory with his angels and his saints to execute judgment on the ungodly of the earth. And so... We understood that. We talked in depthly about what that means for the inhabitants of the earth, what it means for those who do not know Christ, what it means for the enemies of Christ, but also what it means for us as believers. We come back with him. And so that is a great, great picture there in Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 21, of the powerful and glorious return of Jesus Christ. And then what did we say? Upon the Lord's return, the first item on his agenda is the second component of the age of the millennial is the imprisonment of Satan. And so how I want you to kind of look at this is, I gave you those six components so you can say, okay, what makes up the entire span of the millennium? Well, number one, you have the arrival of the king. So that means the millennial, the entire thousand years, will be Christ here. It will be Christ here. He returns. He doesn't return and then go someplace else. He returns and he's here. Well, what is the second component that will make up the thousand years? That's the imprisonment of Satan. Satan will be bound for a thousand years. So throughout the duration of the millennium, Satan will be bound. That's Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 3. It reveals to us the joyous imprisonment of the false god of this present age, Satan, during the entire years of the millennium. And what does that mean? That Satan will no longer be allowed to deceive the nations. And we talked about what that means. That one little statement is so powerful when it says he will no longer be allowed to deceive the nations. That means no more false ideologies, no more false religions, no more false politics, no more deception, world government deception. All those things will be eradicated. Why? Because the false god of this world will be bound for a thousand years. And so we dealt with that in a, a detailed message. And then we started talking about the third component of the age of the millennium. So what makes up the third component, the entire thousand years? Well, Christ will be ruling on the earth. Not only does he return, he returns to rule. Amen. He returns to reign. Amen. He that's, that's what, You see what I mean? It's not just him returning. And then I guess he just whisses off and becomes a great rabbi or something. You know, he walks around and teaches people. No, when Jesus returns, he returns to rule. Mm -hmm. He returns to reign. What did we say? You hear me say it all the time. He doesn't return to play politics. Mm -hmm. He's not going to some accords. He's not going to be a part of the G20, the, the G7. Right. He's not coming to do any of that. And, and we've got to understand it. He's not coming to meet with the Pope. Right. That's right. Right. He's not meeting with the Queen. He's not meeting with Biden. He's not meeting with Obama, Trump. He doesn't care about any of that. He's not coming to play politic games. He's not coming here to talk to the NIH. He's not coming to talk to the CDC, meet with the school people. No. All of that ends because the Bible is explicitly clear that the government will be on his shoulders. Right, right. And so that's what we talked about. So it's very important that we go to, when we go to Revelation 19.15, uh, it says, And he will rule them. Rule who? He will rule the nations with a rod of iron. The millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ is a period of time in human history in which the sovereign rule of God will be visibly manifested on the earth through the person of Jesus Christ. It is a period of time, a period of a thousand years when the sovereign rule of God will be visibly present on this earth through the person of Jesus Christ. We've never seen that before. Do you understand why I keep saying it that way? We've never seen the sovereign rule of God visibly manifested on the earth in the governments, in the politics, in the culture. 
You get it? Right. Christians want to build a Christian culture. You'll never build one. Mm. Why? Because not, it, all men are falling, including the Christians. <laughs> okay. The only one who will build a Christian culture is Jesus Christ. Because he's not greedy. Right. He's not a cheat. <laughs> right. You see what I mean? He's not trying to build a big church. Amen. You get what I mean? So he's the only one that can build a Christian culture. And we will have a Christian culture when Christ returns. We will have the Lord Jesus Christ ruling and reigning as the sovereign king. The sole ruler. Powerful, powerful truth. And we will see the power of God, the manifested power of God, visibly displayed in the culture, in society, in politics, in entertainment, in commerce, in industry. All of those areas will be ruled and reigned by Christ and his saints. Mm -hmm. And so what did that do? Last Sunday it had us talking about the fourth component of the age of the millennial, which is the earthly and heavenly reign of the nation of Israel and the saints. Now we haven't got into the reign yet because we're dealing with how these saints will rule. And so we said that the uh, government of Christ will be both physical, which will be Israel, and spiritual, which will be the church, in which Christ will rule over the earth. In other words, Christ will rule sovereignly and singularly by himself, but he will exercise that rule who? Through the saints. And it's a very, very uh, thing that, that we talked a little bit about it on last week when I say, why do I keep stressing things? When I'm stressing things because I'm trying to get your thoughts to kind of come out from a view of when we talk about Christ reigning, we're talking about the resurrected Jesus reigning. Mm -hmm. Do y'all follow me? Right. Mm -hmm. He's a person. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Right. We're not talking about some Christ ghost mm -hmm. who covering the earth. Mm -hmm. Some Christ consciousness, right. Roscoe. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Oh, okay. When Christ returns, it's going to be his consciousness. No, no, no. He's going to return. The man who got up. Right. Who said, touch me, handle me. Right. Who cooked fish and honeycomb on the side of the, uh, of the bank and, and ate with the disciples. That's right. You get it? He's returning. So because he's returning, he's a person. And because of that, he's, he's not going to be, and you have to say this in careful, like omnipresent all over in the earth. Like right. his body going to be spread out in Georgia over here. No, he's going to be in one place. So how does he sovereignly rule even though he's God? Even though he's God in the flesh, but we understand Philippians chapter 2 gives us that understanding. You see, how did he let uh, strip off his deity, if you will, by becoming a man? He didn't strip it off by ceasing to be God. Right. That's right. He limited certain attributes of his deity by becoming a man. You get it? And so when we see that, I always want to make you sure you understand that. We're not talking about some ghost coming back. We're not talking about some essence, some matrix. Coming back, you know, so some some cosmic brain, you know, we're talking about Jesus who rose from the dead. So while we're talking about saints and we're ruling and reigning, we will literally be able to talk with Christ, see Him. Not when we come and say we we are just blinded by just light and sheer energy. That's not what we're talking about there. Amen. We're talking about Jesus being here. Bodily, ruling and reigning, and exercising that ruling and reigning through the saints and through Israel. And so here's where we go. We go to Revelation 20, chapter 4 through, uh, through 6. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Well, we know that 12 of those thrones are going to be the apostles. Because Jesus literally told the apostles that when I come into my kingdom, you will sit on 12 thrones and be judges over Israel. Mm -hmm. We know that all of us as saints have been cast to do what? Rule and reign with him. We know this. We understand that. And so it says, and also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on its foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Who are they? Those are the tribulation saints. You get it? They're the tribulation saints. We gave you three cla classification of saints. You have the Old Testament saints. Mm -hmm. You have the New Testament saints, which is the church. Mm -hmm. 
and then you have the tribulation saints. You're not a tribulation saint. You're not a tribulation saint. The tribulation saints are those that will be saved during the tribulation. Your salvation is now under the New Testament. We are a part of the church. And so we see here that these tribulation saints, they're going to rule and reign with Christ. And I'm saying that for a reason because, yes, there is a great possibility that after the rapture takes place that many people who knew Lord, the Lord who didn't come to the Lord then. But I don't think that's the right total picture. I think most of those people who are going to get saved during the tribulation are people who are going to get saved. They, they really were rejecting Christ. They didn't want to have anything to do. And now they're going to get saved. I don't think you're talking about people who were fake Christians and lied their way, schemed their way, and now all of a sudden they see when it's real. Now they, the jig's up. Let's go get real now. <laughs> no, I think they're still going to be fake and phony. Wow. I think, if anything, they're going to be angry mm -hmm. that they're left behind. They're going to say, hi, in the world. I knew it was all a lie. It was all a sham. They're going to be angry. Mm -hmm. And so I think what we're talking about is your, your day of salvation is now. Mm -hmm. Don't you be sitting up here banking on the, on the rapture happening, then you know it's all real, and then, hey, I'm cool. I got some more time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't you sit there and bank on that. Mm -hmm. Because if you can't accept Christ now while heads are not rolling, I promise you you're not going to be accepting him when heads are rolling. That's a very, very important point to, to recognize here. Those are the tribulation saints who will come back to life. And in verse 5 it says, And the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of his Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. So Jesus makes it clear that the saints will reign with him for a thousand years. So what do we say? The first agenda on, on Christ is to imprison the false god. What's the second agenda item to resurrect his cabinet? Okay? So the first agenda is to imprison the false god. The second agenda is to resurrect his cabinet. Now, the purpose of resurrection... Write these down. We're going to go through some scriptures in John chapter 5, verse 25. John chapter 5, verse 25 through 29. Listen to this scripture here. This is Jesus speaking. It says, truly, truly, I say, now remember, every time Jesus says truly, truly, the King James says, verily, verily. This is a true statement. Jesus is saying, what I am telling you is the truth. He says, I say an hour is coming and now is here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so has he granted the Son also to have life in himself. So that's talking about salvation. That's talking about those who will hear the voice of the Son of God, the effectual call of God, and be saved. But then he goes on and talks about another group. In verse 25, I'm sorry, verse 27, it says, and he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice. You see the distinction? All who are in the tombs. Who are in the tombs? Dead people. Okay, you and I are saved. Yes, God has risen us from the dead spiritually right now. But ain't none of us in the tomb. Jesus literally says that those who are in the tombs will hear his voice. And do what? And come out. Those who have done good to resurrection of life. What is the doing good? That's not works. The doing good are those who have been, have been saved. Who have accepted that effectual call. Who have responded to that. Who have allowed the work of salvation to be done in the heart. They're going to be resurrected unto what? Unto life. Right. And those who have done evil, rejected the Son, right. rejected salvation. What are they going to be resurrected to? Judgment. Wow. Very, very clear. The Bible makes it clear that the Lord Jesus Christ will resurrect all who are in the tombs, but it also makes it clear that this resurrection from the dead will be life to some and judgment to others. Here's what I always want you to remember. Every human being that has ever lived on the planet will rise from the dead. You will live forever. Where you live forever is a matter of choice. Every human who has ever lived will be raised from the dead to receive a body that is fit 
for eternity in the new heavens or the new earth, or they will be resurrected to a body that is fit for the lake of fire. Do you understand that? Do you understand that the resurrection of life is what the Bible calls the first resurrection? The resurrection of judgment is called the second resurrection, or better yet, the second death. Now, let's go a little bit deeper on this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20-22, it says, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, this is Paul speaking, who is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So, Christ is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Mm -hmm. For as by one man death, right. by a man who came all, it says, I'm sorry, for as by a man came death, mm -hmm. by a man has come also resurrection of the dead. Now, what is he talking about? Mm -hmm. By one man, Adam, death came. Right. What are you talking about? Spiritual death? Physical death right. came. We know Adam brought spiritual death. Mm -hmm. But what is the context of what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 15? Remember, context is important. Paul is not talking about spiritual death right. in 1 Corinthians 15, Mom. He's talking about physical death because he's talking about resurrection. Mm -hmm. Y'all still with me? Mm -hmm. He's talking about resurrection. He's not talking about resurrection spiritually. He's talking about resurrection bodily. So when he makes this statement, it says, For as by a man came death, he's talking about for by one man, Adam, came physical death. By a man also will come resurrection of the dead. So Adam represents the physical death of everybody. Right. Everybody. Right. All who are in Adam. Who is all in Adam? Everybody will die. Well, guess what? Jesus Christ, who is the second representation of humanity, Paul will later on call Jesus who? The second Adam. He is the guarantee that everyone will raise from the dead. Wow, you got to see that. For as in Adam all died, that's not spiritually, all died naturally, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. And it's, it's important you understand the context here. Because I've heard this verse being taught this. Do you know, guys, like, you, you may not hear me on this. Yeah. This is how people teach universal yeah. salvation. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> This is one of the verses they use yeah. because they say, look at this verse. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Yeah. Yeah. See, everybody, just like Adam killed the human race to sin, Jesus has already saved yeah. the human race. Right. Yeah. That's not what that's talking about. Context is important. Yeah. Remember we told you, man, when you take a scripture out of context, when you take the text away from the context, you're left with a con. That's how you get deceived. Yeah. The context of 1 Corinthians 15 is not talking about salvation. It's talking about bodily resurrection. Mm. So when it says, for as in Adam all die, all die physically. Just like in Christ, all shall be made alive. Wow, very important. Very important. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the validation of the resurrection of not just believers, but all of humanity. The resurrection of Christ guarantees us that all of humanity will get up from the dead. Now, the resurrection is the final aspect of God's redemptive plan that will culminate at the end of the millennial reign. Now, please listen. It is important that we understand that the reality of resurrection is the final aspect of redemption. It's not an add-on. It is the final aspect of redemption. There's a final aspect. For the unbeliever, God will raise them from the dead to give them a body that is fit for eternal damnation mm -hmm. in the lake of fire. Amen. Please hear this. Uh -huh. Try hard. Mm -hmm. But I, got, I want you to understand this. Okay. I'm going to repeat it again. The resurrection is the final aspect of God's plan of redemption. Mm -hmm. Now, it has one point for you and I. Uh -huh. It has another point for the unbeliever. It has two points. The resurrection will serve two points. One for the unbeliever and one for the believer. Now, here's the deal. 
for the unbeliever, God will raise them from the dead and give them a body that's fit for eternal damnation in the lake of fire. Okay, so for you and I, God's going to give us a body fit for where we're going to be. All right. He's got to give a body fit for these individuals for where they're going to be. Please understand, the resurrection has a purpose for everybody. I don't know if you ever heard it like this. We understand the resurrection from our point, but it also has a point for the unsaved. It's a part of God's redemptive plan to take care of them. Now, we'll deal with that when we get to the end of Revelation 20, but I just want to give you a taste of this now. Listen to this. When you go to when you go to Isaiah, I'm going to read Isaiah chapter 66. I was thinking, should I not go there, but I want to go ahead and go there. Isaiah 66 verse 24. Because I want you to see that there's something talked about this. How are you saying, Pastor, that the resurrection has a point for the unsaved? Why they need to get resurrected? They should just stay in the grave. No. 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 They have a point to be raised from the dead too. Isaiah 66 verse 24 says, And they shall go out and look on the dead bodies of the men... Who have rebelled against me. Now please. This is talking about during the millennium. Right. It says here. That they shall go out. And look at the dead bodies of the men. Who have rebelled against me. For their worms shall not die. Right. Their fire shall not be quenched. And they shall be an appearance to all flesh. So during the tribulation. I'm sorry. During the millennium. Uh, uh, the Bible talks about that. The, the, the lands of Edom. Mm -hmm. Which are like Jordan. Certain parts of Saudi Arabia, it says, will be turned to pitch. <laughs> and it will be turned to, to sulfur and ashes. And it says that as men are going to worship Christ, are y'all listening? They will be able to look over there and see the bodies of those who have rebelled against God and see them burning. Now, now, now here's the deal. And he says, Isaiah says, for their worm shall not die, and their fire shall not be quenched. Mm -hmm. Now, Jesus uses the same statement right. in Mark chapter 9. So when Jesus uses his statement in Mark chapter 9, he is getting it from Isaiah. Mm -hmm. Jesus is just quoting what Isaiah said. Right. Okay, so what did Jesus say? Now listen to this, are you ready? Listen to how Jesus used it. Now, it's important how Jesus used it. Okay? Listen to how Jesus said it. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to end up, enter life crippled than to have two hands and go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life main than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Yikes. Now listen to this. If you go read that in the King James, you will see they have verse 44 and 46. Now, in the original manuscript, verse 44 and 46 isn't there, but we don't care if they're not there in the original. Why? Because verse 48 is where it says, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Mm -hmm. That's a statement, guys. All these verses speak of an unquenchable fire, which means that the fires of hell are unrelenting with absolutely no relief. Now, keep following me here. Why does that matter if you're thrown into hell and you will be annihilated? Okay, why would Jesus in Isaiah repeat where the fire is unquenched, the fire never goes out, the suffering can... What does that matter if I'm going to be annihilated? Because typically, would you tell anybody, if you took somebody and threw them in the fire now, you're not going to say, you know that fire going to never go out, well, what does it matter? He's going to burn up anyway. He's going to eventually stop living. Right. And he won't feel the fire anymore. Right. He's going to turn to a Chris. He's going to turn to cinders. Right. You see, the, the purpose is to show you that this fire is unquenchable, meaning that 
it will be continually felt. Meaning that these people who go there will never be consumed. They will never stop burning. Okay, you still there? In Revelation 14, verse 11, it says, And the smoke of their tor torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day and night. Right, right, right. Okay. If I'm thrown into a fire right now, if you take me alive right now, my man, threw me in the fire, what purpose would that be to tell me, Sean, you know you ain't going to never get no rest. Dude, I'm going to burn up. If you throw my body into a fire right now, this flesh will burn up. I will get rest pretty soon. Why is they saying this about hell? Why purposely you're hearing that the, the fires are never quenched? The fires never burn out. The understanding is clear, guys. Mm -hmm. Eternal damnation is forever. Mm -hmm. And it is continuously forever. Mm -hmm. And how do we know that these individuals will be resurrected unto a new body that will be fit for that type of punishment? Because guess what? The human body cannot burn forever. Right. Mm -hmm. Think about it. It's only logical to conclude that those who are eternally damned will be given a body that is fit for eternal punishment. So even the resurrection of the dead for the unbeliever has a purpose. Because God can't, what would be the purpose, Lizzie, to take somebody who died away from Christ, raise them from the dead in his old fleshy skin and throw them in the lake of fire? Okay, guys, use your brain. If I threw you in the lava right now, I will give you Less than a second before you will die. You won't feel anything, Jimmy. But if I rose you from the dead, put you back in this new body, it's still you, the same thoughts of you, all of you, and put you in this new body to where you still feel all the pain, but you never die. That's the resurrection of the unsaved. It is a body that is fit to be eternally damned in the lake of fire. You don't want that body. And if you say, oh, they'll never feel this stuff, go read, go, 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 go to Luke 16. Come on, come on. And read about the parable that Jesus gives right. of the rich man who went to hell. Right. Right. He said, Abraham, would you just send Lazarus this way that he could just take the tip of his hand and dip it in the water and just let it touch my that's tongue? Right. Come on, that's right. Come on. Come on. Bible is very clear. Those who don't know Christ will rise from the dead, but they will be given a body that is fit for eternal damnation. But watch this, guys. For the believer, the reality of the resurrection is something different. Say thank God. Thank God. That's not why we're getting rid of rose from the dead. Now, if I don't know Christ, this is what the future has for you. It is a body that is fit for the lake of fire that will never be consumed, that will never die. That will feel all the pain. Your consciousness will be there. Your thoughts will be there. Every thought that you've ever had in your life will be there. Because you're going to be raised with a new body. I, you will remember every thought that you've had. Every rejection of Christ that you give. But you have to deal with that for eternity. But well, why is that fair? Because you sinned against an eternal God. And just like the rich man, when he's in hell, he has no purpose of repenting. All he wants to do is just not come here. And see, that's the purpose of people in hell. It's not like they're going to be, oh, God, I repent now. I repent. I know they're all repenting. No, it's going to be anger. That's why it says there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. A, gnash, a weeping is crying, gnashing. Ah, ah, angry. Angry that I'm here. That you want no part of that. Want no part of that. Young, old, you want no part of that. And thank God that Christ has given us a way of escape through his death, burial, and resurrection. Amen. And we can make sure that we're a part of the first resurrection. As Jesus says, and don't you have to worry about the second one. Because guess what? It has no power over you because you're part of the first one. Now watch this. God has a different purpose for us. Say for me, for me. Why is this? He has promised 
to redeem our bodies. Now let's go on this journey. In John chapter 6, listen to John chapter 6, verses 39 through 40. I want you to listen to it. John chapter 6, verses 39 through 40. It says, And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. Verse 44, no one can come unto me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Notice that Jesus repeats this to the believer. I will raise him up on the last day. Jesus says he will raise it up. What is raise it up? The body. He will raise the body up. On the last day. Then he makes it more personal and individual when he says, I will raise him up on the last day. Meaning, he's not just raising up a body, he's raising up your body. All right. <laughs> he's raising up you, the individual. Jesus will raise your body from the dead. Your body. He's not raising up a mass, some blob, some cosmic soup where we all kind of be a part of it. No, no, no. He will raise up you. Now, this is so important how I'm going to build this theological point. Romans chapter 8. Listen to Romans chapter 8, verse 23. Y'all still with me? Romans chapter 8, verse 23. You can understand this. Amen. Listen to what it says in verse 23. And not only the creation, but also ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit. What do we do? We groan inwardly right. as we wait eagerly right. for adoption as sons. Mm -hmm. Come on. The redemption of our bodies. Right. Notice he says here, we wait eagerly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to be adopted as sons. Mm -hmm. But what are you talking about, Paul? Because I thought you said I'm already on son. The redemption of our bodies. Amen. Very important. For in this hope, right. we are saved. Mm -hmm. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Listen to this. This is a profound statement by Paul because he is saying that right now as believers, we possess the Spirit of God, but that he says that we are eagerly waiting for the adoption of sons. Now follow this. We know that Paul is talking about a couple of different scenarios because listen, in Romans chapter 8, verse 14, so just a couple of verses above that one. Let's say if 23 is down here, 14 up here. So what did he say earlier? Now listen to what he says earlier in verse 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. For the spirit bears witness that our spirit... Uh, that, that, that with our spirit that we are children of God. Earlier, Paul tells us already that we who have received the spirit of God are now sons of God. But now later on, he says, we're waiting eagerly to be sons of God. You get the confusion? He told me earlier I'm a son. Now he's telling me I'm waiting eagerly to be a son. In what way though? The redemption of my body. Oh, man, I hope you guys can follow this. Listen to this. In Romans chapter 8, verse 29, Paul says this. For those whom he foreknow, foreknew, I'm sorry, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that we might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now watch this. Because all New Testament saints have been predetermined by God to be conformed to the image of Christ. Now listen to this. Listen to this. The word conformed literally means in the Greek to have the same form as. Yeah. While the word image in the Greek means likeness to the point of replication. 
So God has promised that we will be conformed to the image of Christ, that we will be like Christ. That's what he has promised us. Now, here you go. Follow the whole thing. As believers, we will not be equal to Jesus in the sense of divinity, mm -hmm. but in the sense of his glorification mm -hmm. as the resurrected son of God. Now, watch this. He's not talking about we're going to become little gods. Mm -hmm. In what way will we be like Jesus in his glorification? Right. Now, here's how we go in salvation. As believers, our, in our salvation right now, our spirits have already been conformed to the image of Christ. The Bible says, if you are saved and you do not possess the spirit of Christ, you are not none of his. You get it? Okay, when you get saved, what is reborn in you? The spirit of God. You then possess the spirit of Christ. Your spirit is that of Christ. You, you follow that, guys, in the spirit. Remember, we're tripart beings, spirit, soul, and body, correct? Right. Our spirits have already been made perfect. Right. Y'all do understand that? Mm -hmm. You can't get any more perfect than what you are right now as a saved individual, individual raised from the dead, from the, from the spirit of death, mm -hmm. by the Holy Spirit, transformed. Your spirit is now one with Christ. That's a, that's a fact. So when he talks about you being conformed to the image of Christ spiritually, you're already conformed to that image. Right. Well, what about the second aspect of a soul? soul. Right. What about our soul? That's sanctification. Right. As we come and we come to church and we come and we read our Bible and we allow the transforming work of the spirit right. to, to, to strip us of sin, to strip us of, of, of those things that, 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 that stop us from, from being like Christ, guess what happens? That's called sanctification. It's a process. Right now, all of us here are in the process of sanctification. Amen. Amen. To where now your soul is being conformed right, to the image right, of Christ. Right, right. You get it? Mm -hmm. What's the only part of you mm -hmm. that has no hope whatsoever <laughs> to be like Christ? <laughs> now y'all laughing. You get it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Lord. <laughs> We can look around at this church and see bodies that don't look like Jesus. I promise you, my body don't feel like Jesus. My knees don't. My voice don't. My eyes don't. I know your body doesn't. So, spiritually, I'm already been made one with Christ. I'm allowing the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit to daily strip away things, Jimmy, to where my soul is being conformed. I'm being renewed in him. I'm being renewed by the truth of the word of God. Amen. But what about this old body? Yeah. Come on. What about this body? Man, I, I, I'm nothing like him. Yeah. I can't walk on a wall. I can't walk on a puddle. <laughs> <laughs> I can't heal anybody. I can't raise anybody from the dead. I can't even stop death from coming to get me. I can't do anything. In this. I'm weak. I'm frail in this body. I'm never like him in this natural body. Now you understand the redemption. Now you understand the redemption. Oh, this is important. Because in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 it says, In him also... When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance Amen. until we acquire possession of it. Mm -hmm. Possession of what? Mm -hmm. Listen, what part of the inheritance are we waiting on possession of? Mm -hmm. Our bodies. Mm -hmm. Our bodies. That's what we're waiting on, guys. We want to be like him. And we will. Listen to this, guys. Part of our inheritance is the future redemption of our bodies. That is, Jesus Christ will resurrect. Watch this. Watch this. Or rapture the bodies of the church and then transform those bodies into replications of his glorified body. Amen. Amen. Why is the rapture such an important teaching for you to understand? 
Because it is the resurrection of the saints. See, we don't, see, guys, you only think about the rapture which you get out here. Do you know every saint that has died, they're waiting on that too. Because the, ra the rapture is not only where we who are alive will remain, but remember, the reason why Paul taught, taught, taught it the first time is so you can understand those who have died and gone on to be with Christ. Do y'all understand what I'm saying? Because the question would be, okay, Paul, I get what you're saying, man. I have to die and go into the ground and become a seed, and then I'm going to be raised up as a new body. Then, then the question would be, well, what if, what if I'm alive when Jesus comes back? Well, what are you going to do with me? Then Paul said, oh, don't worry about it. Not all will sleep. But we should all be changed. So all those who have died in Christ, they're going to be raised from the dead. Those of us, we don't have to be raised from the dead. We're alive. Right. So how do we get this new body? We're caught up. See, the rapture has a bigger purpose than getting you away from the Antichrist. Right. And getting That's you away from high right. gas prices. That's the right. rapture of the church yeah. is the resurrection of the saints. Yeah. That's right. God could care less about the Antichrist and prices and gas and climate and all this stuff. No, he's getting you out of here because he has promised his saints that I will redeem your body. And that redemption takes place at the rapture. Wow. The redemption of the bodies of the tribulation saints takes place at the beginning of the millennium. Right. Ah. And the Old Testament saints as well. Mm. Well, what about all those who are dead? Well, Paul, uh, Jesus tells us, and the rest were not raised until after the end of the millennium. Right. Mm -hmm. You don't want me now. <laughs> you don't have nothing to do with that. Mm -hmm. Let's keep going. I think y'all are getting it now. <laughs> Listen to Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 through 21. Listen to these verses. It says, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it, from heaven, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Watch this. Y'all listening? Why are we awaiting from heaven a Savior? Why are you awaiting? I'm going to say something. If you miss it, you're going to miss what I'm getting at. Why am I pointing this out so heavily? We are awaiting a Savior who will do this, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. Why are you and I awaiting on Christ from heaven so he can transform this lower body? That's what we're waiting on. It literally means that the transformation of the believer at the resurrection of the rapture is simply, oh, here it is. The reason why I kept stressing this, y'all listen, I'm going to read it. The transformation of the believer. What's going to happen to you at the rapture? What's going to happen to you in the resurrection? It is simply changing your outward form mm -hmm. to now match the change that has already taken place in your inward form. Mm -hmm. Amen. You better listen to this. This is so important. What the resurrection does for the believer is just changes the outward form. Mm. It does not change anything about your inward form. What do I mean by that? Mm. It doesn't erase your personality. Mm. It doesn't erase your, 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 your you. It doesn't erase your soul. It just changes your outward body. This is important because watch this, guys. This is this. The resurrection of believers is not changing them into brand new individuals that now want to love Christ. Mm. That now want to glorify him. Right. Right. You already want to do that now. Right. You want to glorify him now, but what stops you? This body. This flesh. It is tempted to sin. It is tempted to fall. It decays. It rises. It's always stuff. You want to do more, but you get up and out of bed. I can't today. Oh, God. You know, you want to remember that verse, but man, I just can't remember it, man. I'm saying it's so trouble, but I can't. Oh, you want to read the Bible, but you got thoughts over here coming in your mind. This over here. Right. It has nothing to do with you hating God now, but you saved. And now when you get resurrected, now I'm going to really love him. No, it has nothing to do with that. That would be a whole new different you. That would be that would not be getting you out of the grave. That would be getting somebody else out of the grave. And you have a lot of believers who say, well, you know, I ain't worried about now because, man, when Jesus comes back, I'm going to be like him. And I know I really love him then. No, no, no. If you don't love him now, I promise you, you ain't getting resurrected to the end. Mm. Huh. Mm. Right. Mm. Okay. 
This is why Paul says over and over again in Romans, listen to this. This is why Paul said in Romans, we groan inwardly. We groan inwardly. If you are saved, you should be groaning inwardly. Because right now, we want to put off this body that is prone to sin, disease, sickness, corruption, decay, ultimately death. We want to put it off. We're groaning inwardly. Listen to what it says over in Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1 verse 20. If you don't believe what I'm saying, this is what Paul says. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body. Well, how will Christ be honored in your body? Whether by life or by death. Paul says, man, I know that Christ will be honored in my body whether I am alive or whether I die. Why do you say that, Paul? Because in verse 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Amen. If, I am a, if I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. What is he talking about? I'm at hard pressed whether I want to stay here or go be with the Lord. He says, for my desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. Man, the true believer longs to depart this life and be with Christ, which is far better. I don't think y'all hear me. I really don't. The true believer longs to depart this life and be with Christ. I'm going to say that one more time. The true believer longs to depart this life and be with Christ. Because why? Paul says this, Aaron. It's far better. As believers, we have zero attachments to this world. Why? Because Paul says to live is Christ and to die is gain. Why? To live is Christ and to die is to gain that which we already have. That's what we're, our mindset is. The resurrection is simply giving us a body to match him who has already been given to us as our sanctification and justification right now. Listen to this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. For we know that if this tent, for we know that if the tent that is our earthly house is destroyed, we have a building from God. Not made with hands, eternal heaven. Do you get what he's saying? See, see, you're missing the point. Paul is literally saying, for we know that if this earthly body is destroyed, we got one built by God in the heavens. What are we worried about? Okay. See, y'all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. what, what are we worried about? What are we worried about? If you were to die, as a born-again believer, don't you know you have a body waiting for you that is not built by this earth, not built by human hands, or not, not you know, medicine helping us out, and, and, and glasses helping us see, and, and braces helping our knees stay together, all this stuff? Amen. We're walking around as cyborgs, all this stuff now to just stay alive? <laughs> you want that? You like the world that much that you will become a cyborg? You want to implant your brain in, in machines to live longer? That's how much sinful people love this world? Wow. And you have born again believers who scream like the dick. Ah, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Amen. You should want to get out of this world. And when God allows you to stay in this world, you should know it's unto his glory. Thank you, Lord. I'm here. Amen. I'm unto your glory. Because we should be like Paul. To live is Christ. To die is gain. He says in verse 2, For in this tent 
we groan looking to put on our heavenly body. Don't get mad at me. What does the Bible say? For in this human body we groan. Mm. And why are we groaning? Because we heard it. No, we're groaning because we want to put on that heavenly body. Mm. We want that resurrection body. We want to be like Jesus. We want to be like him. If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, but that we would rather further be clothed. So that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God who has given us the spirit as our guarantee. Oh my God. I just wish when believe when we're faced with all these things that are going on in this world, Amen. you should tell everybody, sit up, straighten up. Amen. Do you know who you are? Amen. Hold your head up. I'm scared. I know you are, but don't you know you got a body not made? Amen. Don't you want to go? Don't you want to go? Don't you want to put on all that is Christ? Your soul is being sanctified now to be like him. Your spirit is already like him. But what's not like him? Your body. Amen. Amen. I'm saying this for a purpose, guys, because when Paul says we groan, what is the antithesis of that? Unbelievers are not groaning. Unbelievers are not groaning. They love their sin. They love to fulfill the desires of their flesh. They love the world and they love their lives in the world. Unbelievers absolutely love this body of flesh and they're willing to do whatever they can to keep it alive. Amen. Amen. Come on, Amen. Amen. Unbelievers do not care. They will do whatever it takes to keep this flesh alive. Because they have no desire to want that body that is of Christ. We just read what Paul said. Paul said this is how he lived his life. And I guarantee you, he was forced with more things than we will ever be forced with, faced with the Christians. Amen. Paul says, man, I face death every day. You don't face death every day. Paul says, I do. Man, I tell you. Guys, the resurrection is a beautiful thing. It has a purpose for us because it gives us the body that now matches what God is already doing in our souls. Sean, the resurrection is not going to raise some new you that now love Jesus. If you don't have a desire to want to grow in Christ now, if you don't have a desire to want to get in that word, a desire to want to love the Lord Jesus Christ, a desire to want to free yourself from sin, a desire to want to, want to be sanctified, want to be holy, don't you dare think that God's going to raise some new you up from the grave that now want to do all of that. That's right. <laughs> because no, what that means is you were never saved in the first place. Mm. And you're banking on God putting some new, brand new soul in you. So no, you went in the ground as John. I'm coming up as Johnny. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. The same John that went in the ground is the same John that's coming up. <laughs> so now, guys. Oh, man, 10 minutes left. <laughs> What's that body going to look like? <laughs> Look at this. Now I'm going to start this. You probably won't finish it. That's fine. Because now that we understand the purpose of our resurrection, we get it, Jimmy. It's to transform this body. And I think now I'm looking around, you want it. You want that body. What is it going to look like? What is it going to be? But now look at this. Before we say it, we can only go as far as Scripture. And the reason why I'm saying this is because I don't want to turn this into imagination. I don't want to turn it into fantasy. I don't want to turn it into science fiction or foolishness. I don't want to do that, guys. We're, this is not about becoming some Marvel or DC comic hero. No. No. This isn't about us becoming an angel. This isn't about us becoming a god where we get a planet to rule. No. This is not something foolish. This isn't Superman. This, this isn't Wonder Woman. This, 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 we don't want to turn it because you can right. easily take this teaching and turn it into absolute foolishness and, and science fiction. Mm, right. 
and to where it, be, it, it becomes something of a caricature. And you don't want to do that, guys. The resurrection body is real. It is tangible. It is all based upon the authority of Scripture. It's not based upon man's creativity or imagination. This is a real body. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Go there. Everybody go to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 <laughs> Corinthians 15. Let's look at verse 35. It says, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised? And in what kind of body do they come? Now remember, we talked about that last week. Remember, that that's not meant to ask a question like they really want to know. That is what's known as a scornful question. Because the question that the Greeks are asking is, okay, if you believe in this resurrection from the dead, then how are they going to be brought back to life? How are you going to bring a body back to life that's been incinerated? I, think, I want you to think about the pride that this Greek philosopher probably had. How are you going to bring a body back to life that fell in the bottom of the ocean and sharks ate it? How are you going to bring a body that's been decayed, right? Bones have now been putrefied. How, how, how are you going to do that? They think they got something. And if, and if they come back, what they going to look like? Is this the night of the living dead? Is this thriller? Is this uh, ghouls coming out of the ground? How, how, how you going to do that, you foolish, ignorant Christian? And I love Paul's response. You foolish person. Senseless one. Stupid. Look at how he answers it. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies, dummy. And what you sow is not the body of it that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. What does Paul go to? Harvest. He says, you idiot. Don't you know you take a bare grain of kernel and put it in the ground? And don't you know when it goes in the ground, it dies, and then it breaks forth? And what comes out is not a bunch of little kernels on the ground, a big corn stalk that looks nothing like the kernel that went in the ground. But it is the same kernel that went in the ground. It's the essence of it. It's not some, it doesn't go in the ground as a kernel and come up as a giraffe. No, it's, it's a corn stalk. Amen. So Paul says, if you want to deny the resurrection, then deny harvest. Mm. Right, right, right. <laughs> deny what happens when an acorn goes into the ground and a hundred years later it's a humongous oak tree. Paul said, explain that to me. Because I don't think you buried an oak tree in the ground and you got another oak tree up. <laughs> but better yet, guys, we can understand that from our own selves. But I won't get there in a minute. How does he deal with it? The first point Paul gives us to understand is that our resurrection body is through the analogy of a seed. That's easy to understand. We get it. The understanding is that what comes out of the ground is very different outwardly than what was planted into the ground. We get that. You do not plant into a seed into the ground and get something totally different. No. When you plant that seed in the ground, what comes up is something of a different body. Y'all understand that? That's easy to understand. The only thing that changes is the external body of the seed. Do y'all get that? Do you get that even about yourself? Do you get that little Skylar? It's who she is. When Skylar is 44, it will still be the same Skylar. It's not that when she gets 44, now she's a different person. Right. No. Of course, watch this. What changes? Her maturity. Mm -hmm. Those things. But, but, but we get it. Does not your outward body look totally different now than you did when you was an infant? Mm -hmm. I'm looking at our bodies. Mm -hmm. I know you didn't come out your mama like that. <laughs> <laughs> You look totally different. Your external shell looks different. How about you look different when you went into your mama? You don't look like that. But it is you. What? Okay. I'm going to stop. But we understand this. We get it. It makes total sense, guys. 
And Jesus did all the point. He says, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Jesus puts it out there again. Jesus is speaking of his own death and resurrection. Guys, here's the point. The point is that death is nothing more than your body being planted into the ground like a seed. And the resurrection is nothing more than you coming up out of the ground now in a different body. That's all it is. That's all it is. The resurrection is the raising up of you in a different body. Not a different soul, not a different spirit, because those areas have already been transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Already. So now Paul, he destroys their argument with the seed. So you can imagine, right now, the Greek philosophers are just shrewd on the pavement. They're looking for their jaws. They feel embarrassed. They've got, they've, they've totally looked stupid because they tried to get them and they didn't get them. So now he goes on to a different way of explaining it. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 38 through 42. Listen to this. It says, but God gives it a body as he has chosen yeah. to each kind of seed its own body. Yeah. Right, right. Follow this. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is one of a kind, is one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is the glory of the sun. Another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for stars differ from star in glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What does he start off saying first? The overall point is that God has sovereignly chosen to give each kind of seed its own body. How many know God sovereignly chose to give every kind of seed its own body? The understanding is that God did not create clones within everything in creation has its own body. Do you understand it? Do you understand no matter how many human beings are born, no two humans will have the same fingerprints. Do you know your retina scans will be different? And, and how can you have 7.7 .7 billion people and everybody got a different retina? How, how many different combinations of fingerprints can you have? Guys, I'm God. In other words, God made sure, you've heard scientists say, no two snowflakes are the same. Do you know they've also said that no two grains of sand is the same? Who could do that? Only God. Only God. Only God. That's what he's trying to show you here, guys. For Paul says, for not all flesh is the same. Even though all light has the same similar properties, and molecular structure, the external bodies are vastly different. That's true. God has given a different outward body to humans, a different outward body to animals, animals, a different outward body to birds, to fish. All organic life on the earth has different bodies. God chose to do that. All life on earth is only suited for life on earth. Why? Because God created that way. In other words, he created life on earth to be suited for life on earth. Just like he created the heavenly bodies to be suited for the heavens. Come on, guys. Don't, you understand this, guys. You understand. You can't bring a sun into the atmosphere. You get that. You get why the moon can't be in the earth. Okay, you know, moon, it controls the tides. Imagine if the moon was in our atmosphere. What would happen if you bring the sun? No, that's just foolish. That's just stupid. What if you 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 put Mars by clouds? <laughs> Jupiter. No, guys, you get it. Heavenly bodies are designed for the heavens. Earthly bodies are designed for the earth. That's why we cannot live in a different area. Y'all don't get it. He's he's making such a beautiful picture to show you. That God has created uniqueness and difference within creation. Amen. Now why is this important, Aaron? Because you are like this. Because he's telling us the same way he created uniqueness and difference in the earth, so shall it be with our resurrection bodies. There will be uniqueness and difference.
In other words, when you come out of the grave, yes, we'll all share the same spiritual property of being like Christ, but each one of us will be unique. Each one of us will be individuals. We will be different. We will not come up as clones. Amen. Thank God. And one of the ways he shows us this is this. Amino acids are the building blocks of life that create proteins that make up life. Now look at this. And I got this on the CDC website. I don't know how much you want to believe it. But here we go. <laughs> Scientists estimate that there are 500 amino acids identified in nature with only 20 known amino acids found in the human body, with only nine of the 20 being essential and the other 11 being non-essential. So now watch this. Scientists say there are over 500 in nature. Only they've identified 20 in the human body, and out of those 20, only nine are essential and 11 are non-essential. Now follow this. It is the amino acids in different combinations that create differences in life. They did an estimation of this. <laughs> that is 20 to the hundredth power. That's 20 with 100 zeros of different possible protein structures for God to reproduce in differences. 20 with 100 zeros behind. And God says... I will take billions of Christians, raise them from the dead, and in 1.6 nanoseconds, take all those different possibilities, and every one of y'all will have a different structure and a different body. And I'm going to do that in less than half a nanosecond. Amen. I'm going to take all the proteins, put them in a boom, 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 you get boom, it's all done. <laughs> to me, that's mind boggling. <laughs> That's mind-boggling. That's mind-boggling, guys, of what God's going to do. Wow. I'm going to stop there. We just have to pick it up next week. Because I think that's enough. Because he goes on even more to describe even more of this resurrection body. But I think what I wanted you to learn today is this. Let's summarize what we learned today. Because we got more to talk about, but I don't, I'm just going to stop. I'm going to stop right now. What I want you guys to see is that when we, when we talk about our resurrection bodies, we're not talking about being raised from the dead as, as, some, as some clones. You're going to be different. But more importantly, you're going to be you. You're going to be you. Let me just give you a taste of that. We know it's going to be you because when Jesus rose from the dead, they were able to recognize him. Right, that's right. Mm -hmm. They knew him. Watch this. He still had his cognitive understanding. He knew them. He didn't rise from the dead. Who are you? I don't know who you are. He knew who they were. He knew what Peter did. Now watch this. He knew what Peter did, and he did, came back to life, still remember what Peter did. So he remembered what Peter did in the life he was once living in. So that means you got memory. Hmm. Watch this. He, he even told his like, touch me, handle me. They were able to touch him. That means he's not ethereal. He's, he's not Casper. Right. Mm -hmm. Guys, we, we understand this beauty of the resurrection to understand that when we raise from the dead, it's going to be you. And this is why I'm trying to refute this idea that when we talk about coming from the dead, oh, it's going to be something different you now, a different you that loves Jesus. Now, now all of a sudden, now you really want to stop sinning. No, no, no. You better say that again. You better love him now. Jimmy, you better be telling the Holy Spirit, Lord, Holy Spirit, man, wash me clean. Wash me with this word. You better have a desire in you right now working in you. Man, God, I want to abstain from sin. But, Lord, the thing that I want to do, man, sometimes I find myself doing it. The thing that I don't want to do. You, say, you want to be able to have that type of test, but not the thing that I don't want to do. I do it and love it. Love it. Because I know that in the resurrection, God going to stop me from doing it. No, he won't because you're going to stay in the ground. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to have you sit in this church and believe it, that you can sit around and play, and you're going to get resurrected to some new you that love Jesus now. No! You love him now. Guys, think about what we read earlier. 
We should be groaning. Yes. We should be groaning right now. I know I do, Roscoe. <laughs> we should be groaning. Man, if something happened to us, man, we should be like, oh, Lord, man, that's, I'm closer to me with Jesus. But you know, hey, if I stay, that's good for Lindsay and the kids, man. I mean, I'm, I want to do that. I'm not talking about us being morbid and right. us, us walking in the death situation, being <laughs> suicidal. Right. You crazy person. It's not what we're talking about. Yeah, you know, John, right, man, I got, let's just die today. <laughs> no, you out of your mind. No. That's not what we're talking about. <laughs> exactly. There is a benefit of, of, of gray hair. Right? But what I'm saying, we don't have this incessiveness of what we see what's going on in our world today. Right. Right. Not the born again believer. Right. Exactly. This is why I tell you guys, if you ever find yourself in a debilitating position or a disease or whatever, or things of that nature, we know it's happened. Nobody wants to get into that situation. But here's the deal. You know, man, I got a body. So then how do you get that believer down? Right. You can't. Even in this culture that we have today, you can't get us down. We're not afraid. We're not afraid of anything, guys. Well, not because we're stupid and we take foolish risk. Amen. <laughs> I'm not talking about you not loving yourself to the point where you're taking risks. You know, since I, since we since we gonna get the body, man, I'm gonna drive 100 miles per hour. You know, I'm gonna go parachute. I'm gonna do everything I want to do. Cause you know, at the end of the day, I'm gonna die. No, that's not what I'm talking about. You're being foolish. <laughs> But what I am saying, guys, we don't let the devil and all his fear tactics run us crazy to where now we're making unwise choices. Right, right. Crazy decisions to preserve our lives in this earth, knowing that we got a body down in hands. We're going to finish it up. I have way more to say. But we'll continue it next week. Come on, stand to your feet. Amen. Hallelujah. Man, I know you can't wait. Don't forget, guys, we're going to continue our series as we continue to walk through Revelation. Join with us. Go on our YouTube page, Eternal Purpose Fellowship. Facebook page, Eternal Purpose Fellowship. Website, Eternal Purpose Fellowship. We'd love to see you here one day. Until then, God bless. Amen.